Uh, so welcome everyone to the Applied Algebraic Topology uh, online seminar. Um, the speaker today is Antia Monod, and she will talk about the tropi tropical geometry of phylogenetic tree spaces. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get, just get started. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to sort of like apologize in advance because this talk is sort of not very sort of like, uh, I guess, classical applied topology or topological data analysis, but it is very geometric and um, there are some kinds of related themes. So hopefully you will still find it uh, interesting and, um, and, and relevant. So um, yeah, so, so basically this talk also is largely going to be kind of like an overview um, of the sort of problem that I'm interested in and um, you know, the sort of approaches there have been and, and, and then sort of like at the very end, a, a very kind of non-technical overview of, of the things that I've done so far. But uh, given that this is sort of uh, a talk to, to you know, maybe a community that's not very, um, maybe not very familiar with these ideas, I thought that it would probably be better if I sort of, um, you know, sort of focus on this rather than like dive right into, you know, the stuff that I've uh, worked on. But uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm also very happy to, you know, um, talk about that later on at some point, or basically if any of you are interested in this kind of stuff, then please do connect with me to discuss further. Um, okay, so let me see if I can. Okay, yeah, so here's the introduction. So um, we're interested in phylogenetic trees here. So they're, they're um, symbolic objects that model um, evolution and they're really fundamental in biology, right? And so they basically are used to model almost, I mean, very, very many important phenomena in biology. So this can range from speciation um, as well as the spread of uh, pathogens and viral evolution as well as cancer evolution. So these are all modeled by phylogenetic trees. So they're very, very important data structures in biology, um, but they're also really difficult to work with. So um, one, of the, one of the most important um, challenges of, of um, phylogenetic trees is that they can be very large, right? So they sort of classify as one of these sort of big data objects. Um, but in addition to that, it turns out that their discrete geometric structure actually results in a non-Euclidean tree space. So if you want to actually do um, data analysis with sets of uh, phylogenetic trees, um, it's difficult because you're basically not able to use any of those sort of standard machinery that um, relies on um, Euclidean space, right? So, so essentially, it's uh, it's figuratively, it's, it's an evolutionary tree, right? So it basically um, depicts relationships between taxa with a, a common ancestor. Um, and so, I mean, here are sort of two figurative illustrations. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here are two figurative illustrations here of um, a phylogenetic tree where you have some kind of root and then you have the evolutionary process and then you have this branching and then you have all these different species here. Um, this was, of course, this is a, a sort of picture from Darwin's um, notebook where he actually also sort of um, looks at the, the, you know, this sort of model of, uh, of relationships with this kind of tree-like structure. Um, okay, so this is this is sort of like a, a very kind of broad overview of the kind of objects um, I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so here is sort of like a, a more formal um, definition of these these ideas. So notation and terminology. So in this talk, big N is going to be the number of leaves, right? And I'm going to denote by bracket N as um, this the the leaf label set, and small N is going to be big N choose two. Okay. So here, um, an N tree, big N tree, is a tree with N leaves. Um, a binary tree is one where the degree of V, a vertex V, um, is given by the following. So if it's degree two, then um, V is the root, right? And root, roots are always unique in a tree. There's only one root. Um, if the degree is one, then V is a leaf. And if it's greater than two, then it's an internal vertex, right? So um, in binary trees, right, internal vertices are always um, at, uh, greater than two. Um, so there's a combinatorial result, result from 1870 that um, says that the number of binary entries is 2n minus 3 double factorial. So this is all the number of um, the different kinds of um, tree topologies. So by this, I really mean branching, um, branching configurations and, and leaf labels. Um, so there are two n minus three double factorial of them. Um, a metric entry is one where you have non-negative lengths on all of the edges, right? So metric entries are also known as phylogenetic trees. So um, that's sort of like the mathematical terminology here. So by phylogenetic tree, I'm really talking about a metric entry here. Um, and then edges connecting to leaves are called external edges and everything else is an internal edge. Okay, so uh, a bit of motivation. So where 
where, where do phylogenetic trees come from, right? So the idea here is that you have an input of alignment of sequences for N species, right? This DNA, RNA, and then you'd like to come, you know, like to output a phylogenetic tree. So um, this is this is like a whole field of research where there's been a lot of work done and it's a very difficult problem um, and really interesting as well. But uh, this is not the focus of my talk today, but I still want to give you a bit of a motivation where these where these trees come from and why um, what I'm going to talk about today is interesting based on um, where these 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 trees come from. So um, basically from this um, alignment of sequences and then the phylogenetic tree. So the construction method, there's basically two. Um, two sort of camps, right? The first is the statistical methods, right? So it's mostly some kind of statistical optimization problem, right? So um, you can have like maximum likelihood or maximum parsimony. Uh, parsimony. Um, the, the idea here about the statistical methods is that there's a lot of uncertainty um, because the resulting tree, the output phylogenetic tree is highly sensitive um, to the input sequences, right? So it really highly depends on what you input um, into, into your mechanism to get at the tree. So for example, if you have different genes or you, you're looking at different coding regions, um, this will actually give you a different tree. Um, also measurement errors, right? So if you have an alignment error or a sequencing error, um, this will actually give you phylogenetic, a different phylogenetic tree. And um, these are errors that actually come right up quite a lot in biology. So um, it is a very sensitive method, and um, you can actually um, get out uh, different trees based on based on the input. So um, that's one method, and that's sort of like a, it's 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 been high, it's been a very top a hot topic of of study in statistics. Um, the other method is a distance-based methods. So these are sort of, um, the, for example, the neighbor joining method. So the idea here is that you're reconstructing a tree from a genetic distance matrix, right? And then what you do is you position um, closely related sequences under the same node, and then branch lengths um, correspond to the observed dis distances among um, sequences. Right? So that's more sort of a, a, const a constructive method. Um, so this is actually a really, really hard problem. Right. So um, what's known is that finding the optimal tree is an NP complete problem. Right. And this is only under the assumption of uniform distributivity of um, the, the, the sequences. Right. So here NP complete. Right. So NP complete a reminder that even though it's um, more optimistic than NP hard, NP complete problems doesn't mean that they're easy. Right, so it means that it's easy to check if a candidate solution is optimal, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to actually find candidate solutions. Right, so um, it, it is a very hard problem, and um, it's something that's highly highly sensitive. Right, so given that, this is sort of the motivation of what I want to study here. Right, is like how to compare trees. Right, so if you have um, two trees that come out of your tree reconstruction process, for example, um, from statistical methods, which are highly sensitive. Right, you want to be able to compare these um, construction methods and see, okay, how similar or different are they? How good is one compared to another? Right. Um, you'd also like to to sort of ask what's a typical tree, right? So if you have, you know, if you do this tree reconstruction process uh, again and again, is there some kind of um, typical tree that you actually see coming out of the process, right? And then um, how do you do statistics with samples of trees more generally, right? So. Um, coming from, you know, the sort of like method of looking, constructing one tree here, what we have is we have lots of trees coming out, right? And then we have a sample of um, trees and we would like to be able to do statistics with these, right? So um, I'm gonna give, um, so the, the overview of the talk here is I'm going to talk about like the, 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 the space, which is sort of um, the setting BHV space, um, which is known to be the sort of uh, like, you know, the, the kind of classical space by now of um, doing analysis for sets of trees. Um, and then I'm going to talk about tropical geometry and phylogenetic tree spaces. So this is also something that's um, newer um, than BHV space, but uh, and, and kind of more abstract. But uh, and then, um, but you know, I, I, I would like to argue though that it's also an interesting space to actually do these kinds of um, computational studies for, and then um, talk about some of the recent work that I've done um, on the tropical geometry of tree spaces. Okay. Um, Okay, so if you want to compare phylogenetic trees, right, you need a similarity measure, right? So in this case, it's like some kind of distance measure or, or metric, right? So in biology, people have done this, and they've done this by looking at um, inner product distances, right? So these are sort of looking at distances constructed off these um, off of a, an inner product um, structure, right? So for example, the Robinson folds metric is very popular in biology, um, but it's it's not 
it's not very good in terms of interpretation, right? So you, the, the, the Robinson's fold, um, Robinson folds metric suffers from um, structural and interpretive, like interpretation errors, right? So what, what happens in the, in the Robinson folds metric is that there's many pairs of trees which actually measure the same distance apart from one another. And large distances between trees doesn't necessarily mean that you have large differences between shared leaf ancestry, right? So this is a, it's like, it's even in biology, there's an intuition problem here um, using the Robinson Fultz metric. Um, so um, what has been, um, you know, about 20 years ago now has been proposed by um, Biller, Holmes and Boatman, uh, looks at the geometry of these tree spaces, right? So what they're doing here is they consider a, a moduli space Right, so the moduli space here really means is that you're representing each tree as a single point, and then you characterize um, the space, the, the space um, by a geometry. Right, so in BHP space, the geometry is actually characterized by geodesics, which induce a metric on the space. Right, and it's something that's um, very interesting and important, and it appears a lot in many other fields, so combinatorics, um, even category theory, computer vision, and of course computational biology. Um, it has quite an intuitive construction. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's the, the current standard for quantitative studies on tree space and people are using this um, a lot in, in biology these days. So, okay, so I'm going to present that now and sort of give you an idea of what BHV space is. So um, there's two ways that you can construct BHV space. So the first one here that I'm going to talk about now is a geometric construction. So um, BHV space um, ignores it external edges of trees, right? So it defines a tree as a single point by looking only at its internal edges, right? So for a binary um, entry, they're at most n minus two internal edges. So in this case here, every tree is represented by a vector of dimension n minus two, right? And each entry in this vector um, corresponds to the length of the internal edges, right? So um, given that there are two n minus three double factorial ortho, um, you know, um, different tree types, right? Then you assign an ortho to each tree type, right? And so the beach tree space here is basically um, two n minus three double factorial orthants of um, degree n minus, of dimension n minus two, right? So basically you're, you're looking at a union of these sort of Euclidean orthants here. So, um, how do you actually join these orthons together? Well, um, you look at the boundaries of these orthons, um, which actually correspond to collapsed internal edges or also known as degenerate trees, right? So these are zero where um, the internal um, edge length is zero. And then you graft orthons together along their common boundary, if and only if two binary trees share common degenerate trees, right? And orthons are always grafted at right angles. So let me show you an example here. Um, so here we have three different tree topologies, right? So here on the left here, this is one tree topology where we have two internal, so it's four leaves. So we have two internal edges. So we represent um, this tree by um, a, a point in the plane um, with um, entries 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Um, and similarly here, but this is a different tree topology from this one because the leaf labeling is different, right? So the shapes of the tree are the same, but here, instead of one, two, three, four, we have one, three, two, four. So this is represented by another tree in a different orthant. And then notice here that this is, um, this is the collapsed internal edge between um, leaf two and three, right? So this has um, an a internal edge of zero, right? So this tree here is only represented by one internal edge, right? So it's a point on the, um, on the boundary here. So we can graft the orthant corresponding to this tree topology and this tree topology together, um, which coincide with this tree topology here, where you only have um, one internal edge length um, and the um, two, three internal edge collapse, right? So this is how you sort of glue um, orthants together in beach free space. Um, okay. So um, there's this, um, you, for each orthant, there's this, um, this set called the link of the origin, which I want to talk about now. So you consider this set here, right, this LN here. Um, and this actually gives rise to a simplicial complex of dimension n minus three, right? So this here is the link of the origin. And you can sort of think of, you can sort of think about it as like the sort of skeletal structure of BHV space. So BHV space is actually an infinite cone over this simplicial complex here, right? So here's an example here, right? This is the BHV space of, um, of trees with three leaves, right? And this is represented over these three points here. So here, the link of the origin here is actually these three points, right? And the space is really with a cone over all of these three points, 
Okay. So that's sort of the geometry of it. You can also look at it in a combinatorial way, right? So uh, combinatorially, right, you can consider a fixed entry. So each internal edge defines a bipartition of the set, like a bipartition of the set of, of leaf labels, which includes the root here. So um, we're looking at splits here. So a bipartition is called a split, right? If and splits are compatible if one of the following holds, right? So here's an example again. So these are the same trees that we looked at before, right? So it turns out that this tree and this tree, um, these, these two tree topologies here are compatible, right? And these two tree uh, topologies here are compatible, right? But this tree topology is not compatible with this tree topology, right? So, so um, that, that's the sort of like the idea of having splits here and compatibility here, right? So, from this, these splits, right, you can actually construct a, a flag complex, right? So each split of the, um, the leaf labels represents a vertex, right? So in your flag complex, right, you can actually define, um, you, you assign a vertex to each split of, the, of the, the leaf labels, and then you join two vertices, right, if um, by an edge, if two splits are compatible, right? And then um, you can actually sort of uh, go a bit further and say that like a k-simplex is spanned if it's k plus one vertices are connected by edges and each maximal simplex here represents a tree topology, right? So here it turns out like here's an example here. Um, it turns out that for um, the, the, the space of um, trees with four leaves, right, then this um, Pearson graph here is actually going to be, this is, this is the flat complex for the, the space of phylogenetic trees with four leaves. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this later on, but um, it turns out that this flat complex is precisely the um, link of the origin. Um, and we note that from this combinatorial construction here, we can see that um, the link of the origin has the homotopy type of n minus one factorial spheres of dimension n minus three. Um, and that two facets share a co-dimension or one face if and only if the trees differ by a rotation, right? So let me give you maybe a bit more of a concrete example of what this means, right? So here, um, the figure on the left, right? This is an um, uh, example of some of the orthons of beach tree uh, space with four leaves. Right. So here um, in this orthant here, you have this tree topology one, two, three, four. So it's defined by these two internal edges. Right. So the um, internal edge connecting leaf one to the two, three, four um, uh, uh, set of leaves. And then here, this is the internal edge connecting to the three, four set of leaves here. And then this shares a common boundary with this tree topology here, right, where you have this length here connecting to the three, four leaves. Right, and then from this tree topology to this one here, right, you share this um, internal edge connecting to the one to um, collection um, clade of leaves right here, right. So this is the way that you can sort of join these five orthens of BHV space here. Um, and these are only some of the orthens of um, the, the space of uh, BHV space with trees with four leaves, right. And they correspond to these edges here. Um, in the Peterson graph with the darkened circles, right? So you can see here that one, two, three, four, this edge here corresponds to this tree topology here. So this orthant here, right? And then it's joined um, by this node here to, which is represents this um, orthant boundary here to this tree topology in one, four, two, three, right? And then, so you can sort of go around these, um, these edges here, right? These five edges of the Peterson graph to give you these five edges here, but um, you actually have the, the relationship between um, the other tree topologies that arise um, in the space here. Um, so basically, in, in the case of, of, of four leaves, you can completely characterize the space by the Peterson graph um, of this figure here. So in the space, in the case of four leaves, everything is nice and you can actually do everything um, sort of explicitly and by hand. But of course, as the number of leaves gets larger, it gets much more complicated. Um, okay, so this is the construction of beach fee space, right? And um, there's, so the geometry of this space here is actually given by, um, it's based on geodesics, right? So it's an implicitly defined distance. So um, how do you compute the BHV metric? So like how, how, how do you do this sort of intuitively? So um, in the case of the same orthant, right? So the same tree topology, right? This is kind of easy because basically you're just in a Euclidean orthant. So you can just compute the Euclidean distance between these two. Right. So the real problem here is what happens when you have trees living in different orthons, right? So what 
is a geodesic, right, which is the shortest path between two trees that live in different orthons. Okay, well, this is a bit more complicated because it depends on what the position of the orthons are in relation to one another, right? So if you have two orthons which are next to each other, for example, in this picture here, right? There are two ways that you can get from a tree in this orthon to a tree in this orthon, right? So one way is you can go through the origin, right? You can just shrink everything, um, all the internal edges to zero and then expand them again to get to this orthon, right? Or you can go through the common boundary, right? Um, instead of going through the origin, right? And it turns out that going through the common boundary between these two orthons is the faster way to get to from one tree to the other one instead of going through the origin, right? Um, and it turns out that uh, for trees, I mean, and this, this also generalizes, right? It doesn't actually have to be two neighboring orthons, right? You can also have orthons which are very close to each other where the fastest way to get from one to the other is to go straight through them. Right. But if you have orthons which are very, very far away from each other, then the fastest way to get to the other orthon is actually through the origin. Right. So this is known as a cone path where you shrink all of the internal edges to zero and then re-expand them to get the tree um, topology that you're interested in. Right. Um, so it turns out that uh, one of the main theorems of this B3 paper is that um, this construction is actually a cat zero space, which means that geodesics are unique. And um, the, the fastest current um, algorithm to compute these geodesics is um, given by Owen Proven in um, polynomial time. Um, and it's uh, the complexity of zero to the n, um, n to the power of four. Okay. Um, okay, right. So this is B tree space, and this is sort of the metric on, um, on the space, right? So, um, okay, so phylogenetic trees, right? This is, you can actually define them as metrics. Right, so um, you can specify a tree by all pairwise distances between the leaves, right? So this is a sort of distance matrix where you can actually just put the leaf labels on the, along the rows and the columns, and then after that specify um, the, 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 the matrix with the, the pairwise distances between the leaves. And then you can stack this, um, this matrix as a vector, right? So if you take this, um, this row here, and then after that, just stack all the rows on, um, on the end of it, Right, and continue this way, then you can actually get a vector in our little n, right? So our little n here is big N choose two, right? So in this case here, you can look at a map, right? So what we're here looking here is a map from um, tree space into Rn, right? So Rn here is like a Euclidean vector representation of this, right? So here, um, I mean Tn here, I mean general tree space, right? So remember that in B tree space, um, they um, ignore the external edges, right? Here, I'm going to sort of expand this to include the lengths of the external edges as well, right? So here, this map W maps from trees with the external edge lengths um, included into Rn, vectorial um, representation. Okay, so now we want to study this map, right? So what's so what are questions we can ask about this map? So the first one is, is W injective, right? So the idea here is that we want injectivity because we want we don't want to identify trees in Rn with um, different topologies, but the same tree metric, right? So here's an example, right? This is the tree metric, right? This vectorial representation of both of these trees. But you can see here that they have a very um, clearly different tree topology, right? Completely different shape um, and also different um, different internal edges and everything, right? So um, so, um, so the question here is, is that um, pairwise distances actually along the leaf labels is not enough to, um, um, to I uniquely identify trees from their, their um, their tree metric here. So if you want to fully determine an entry, you also have to include the root. Right, so um, n plus one right here. But I, I mean, in, in, in my case, I've actually included big n to be, include zero, right? But typically people would just write zero, one, two, three, four. So here really what you're talking about is five, right? So if you have zero as the, as the root as well, you, can, um, you need to include the root in order to be able to fully determine the tree by um, pairwise distances. Um, so, okay. So basically what we have now is you can just basically consider unrooted trees by viewing the root as a leaf with label zero, all right, um, as a degenerate external edge, right? So that's sort of like a, a zero length um, external edge, right? That's, that's how people basically identify these unrooted trees with, um, with rooted trees. But the idea here really is to include the leaf, um, uh, the, the root uh, leaf label zero as the root to be able to get um, move from unrooted trees to rooted trees and rooted trees is what we need in order to be able to um, identify to, to have WB um, injective. Okay. 
so um all right so okay so now we have um an injective map right which maps trees to euclidean space right so this is sort of good news this looks like we have simplified our case you know our problem a lot because now we have some sort of euclidean space to 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 work with trees right um but no we actually have to go a bit further than that right so now the question that we have to ask is what's the image of w right so 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 understanding the image of w is really important here because um if we have a linear space then we can just use linear algebra um, if we have a manifold, then we can use sort of Romanian geometry, right? Um, but it turns out that the image of W is actually really complicated. Um, it turns out that it's both nonlinear and non-smooth. Um, so, um, okay, so a bit of you know, construction about how to study the image of W, right? So you can reduce the dimension of the ambient space, right? By um, dis not distinguishing between trees that differ by a constant on the external edges, right? So this gives rise to um, the tropical projective torus, which is this quotient space here, right? So this quotient space here, um, it's generated by an equivalence relation where for two points in Rn, right? You consider two points to be equal if all coordinates of U minus V are equal. Um, you can also generate this uh, space by a group action, right, in the following way, right, so you have this group G here um, with coordinate wise addition, which acts on, on, on Rn, and it turns out that um, this here, this group action also defines a map, right, so you can also do this by further reducing um, the, the um, pro tropical projective torus to um, another quotient space, right, quotient up by the image of this map phi, right, so basically what we have here is we have this sort of nice algebraic construction of these quotient spaces where you get a sequence of maps from um, tree space into Rn into a smaller space, which is a tropical projective torus, into a smaller space, which is this quotient space um, quotiented by the, the image of your map phi, okay? Um, okay, so now I'm gonna move on to talk about tropical geometry because I sort of hinted at this by call, you know, calling this the tropical projective torus and saying that it's an interesting space to study this question of what is the image of W? Okay, so what is tropical geometry? So um, the in the algebraic geometry, the sort of like uh, main main motivation here is to study the geometry of, of zero sets of systems of polynomial equations, um, right? So the polynomials in tropical geometry, right, are defined by the tropical semi ring, where you have um, the operations of addition given by the min of two elements, right, and the 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 product of two elements given by their their usual sum. Right. So basically here in tropical geometry, we study the zero sets of polynomials given by these operations here. So here's an example of a tropical polynomial of x squared plus one. So here for x squared plus one, you take all of the operations and then you just replace them by their tropical counterparts. And it turns out that the tropical polynomial x squared plus one is just the minimum um, between two x and one. So you get this sort of piecewise um, linear structure here, this kind of skeletal structure here. So tropical geometry can be seen as sort of like a skeletal version of algebraic geometry. Um, and so how is tropical geometry related to phylogenetic trees? It actually turns out to be, you know, a, a quite useful and promising tool to study um, phylogenetic trees. And this was, um, this was uh, basically discovered by um, Speyer and Sturmfels in 2004. Um, by in, 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 in this construction of the tropical Grassmannian, which I'm going to talk about now, right? So, okay, the tropical Grassmannian. All right, so tropical polynomials, so I gave you the example of x squared plus one before, but you can generalize these, right? So you can actually make tropical polynomials in n variables, right, by basically looking at this min of the sum here, right? Um, so you can define a tropical hypersurface, which is a set of all vectors, Right, where these the, this um, this tropical polynomial is at least is attained at least twice. Right, so this is the definition of a tropical hypersurface here. So um, the there's an object in algebraic geometry that people care about, um, the Grassmannian, which is a uh, is a, which is a projective variety given by this expression here. And it turns out that here this equation here this linear equation. This is actually very, very important in tropical geometry. And this is sort of, it looks very innocent and very and very simple, but it's actually very nice because it gives rise to lots of um, important implications um, in, in tropical geometry. So it turns out here that if you 
um, take this uh, projective variety here and tropicalize, right? So basically replace a polynomial by its tropicalization, right? Then you get this tropical grass manian, right? Um, and so basically um, what you have here is you replace the polynomial by its tropical uh, uh, counterparts and the vanishing set of intersections of tropical hypersurfaces, right? And, and um, it turns out that this tropical grass manian um, for two leaves, uh, for uh, uh, in, in in dimensions, is the intersection of these tropical hypersurfaces here. Okay, so okay, how do we visualize this object here? Right. So remember, we had the sequence of maps from tree space into Euclidean space into the tropical projective torus into this quotient space um, quotiented by the image of phi, right? So we know. So this is this is basically what the, the, what um, Speyer and Stromfeld showed in their paper. Right, is that so? The image of G2n, right, in Rn minus one. So basically, looking at this, this, uh, this map here, right. So this, pro this progression here, right. The image of G2n is a fan um, with dimension um, 2n minus two in this space here, in the tropical projective torus. Now, if you want to move from the tropical to projective torus into this quotient space here, so the image of the same object, right, is another fan with dimension n minus three. So you can actually further in, um, intersect the, the, the object in this space here with the unit sphere, and this will actually give you a polyhedral complex, right? So here, the polyhedral complex where each facet is a polytope of dimension n minus four. So the main theorem that they proved here is that um, G2n double prime, right? So basically um, the, the um, the tropical Grassmannian and its representation in um, the, 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 this quotient space here, this final quotient space here, is actually tree space. And then actually when you take the further intersection of the image um, in, this, in this quotient space with the unit sphere, um, it actually coincides with the, the link of the origin in B tree space. Right? So here, let's go to look at an example with four leaves. Right? So in four leaves, right, G24 is this hypersurface here. We have this tropical hypersurface, right? And so equivalently, it basically consists of points such that um, at least one of the following systems holds, right? So we have these three um, equations right here. Um, note that if you are looking at equality right here, then you actually get a five-dimensional hyperplane in R6. If you're looking at inequality, you get a closed half space in R6. And then the intersection of the system is isomorphic to um, R4 across um, the, the real line, the positive half of the real line. So since there are three systems, right, you get um, G24 prime, right? So G prime is the union of three of these spaces glued along this ray, right? So this is the image of phi, right? So here phi we're mapping from R4 to R6, right? And um, the, the, the tree space here consists of these three, um, these three rays and the um, link of the origin is three points, right? So this is actually what we've seen before um, when, I, when I looked at the sort of construction of beach free space. So here's a tropical grass manian, right? Here's what we're looking at here in the Euclidean space. Here is when we're mapping into the tropical projective torus. Here's into the quotient space. And further on, when you intersect, right, it gives you the link of the origin, right? So, Basically, this gives you a coincidence between the tropical grass manian and um, the, the beach tree, tree space, well, actually tree space in general, including the external edges. And it gives you an alternative representation of tree space, um, which um, I find interesting and which we study further for computations, right? Um, so how is this actually relevant to, to trees, right? It turns out that there's also this coincidence here with um, what's known as the four-point condition. So it turns out that um, basically interpreting the equations of the the Plucker embedding of, of the of the of the tropical grass grass uh, the Grassmannian into um, the the tropical version, it recovers this four point condition here. So the four point condition here um, basically tells you what you need in order for a uh, you know a basically um, a, a collection of distances in order for it to be actually a phylogenetic tree. Right, because you can write down a distance matrix, right, and you can say that okay, these represent leaves, right? But how do you actually know that it's actually a tree? Well, you need to you know that it's a tree if the Plucker relations, which are these three um, um, equations here, um, where the maximum of all of these is, is attained at least twice, right? Or if you equivalently have this inequality satisfied here, right? So so basically. 
um, you can look at it, if you're looking at the fact that you need that the maximum of these is chain at least twice, you're actually looking at this to be a tropical hypersurface, right? But the only difference here is that um, you're replacing the min with the max, right? And this is okay, right? Because basically, if you're looking at the tropical semi-ring where you replace the min operation with a max operation, you get an isomorphism, right? So, so basically, this is like, it, it's really just a different interpretation. It's basically a matter of rotating, like turning your paper all the way around and getting the same thing. So, so basically what this tells us is that the image, the image of W, our map W, is exactly this tropical Grassmannian, right? So, um, okay, so now we can look at this tropical Grassmannian and, you know, say, okay, like what, what, what can we do with this? What, what, what can we, what can we say in this setting, in this alternative perspective other than beach free space? Um, so maybe before we do that, I'll just give you a quick example of trees here in this whole, um, you know, um, four point condition, right? So here, this is a, a phylogenetic tree. Um, you can write down um, it, the, the, you can represent this tree as a matrix, right? So basically you have like all the distances between um, all the leaves here, and then you can stack it as a vector, right? And then you write down the Pluca relations. You see that the maximum is achieved twice and that this inequality holds here. So you, you indeed have a tree, right? Um, okay, so, all right, so we have beach free space, we have this tropical version and everything, and so why would we care about tropical, about the tropical representation, right? So we have this very nice, elegant, intuitive construction by beach free space, right? Why do we care about doing all this sort of complicated um, mappings and asking questions about images and, and, and injectivity and everything like that? Um, to look at the tropical perspective. Well, the reason why is because if you wanna do statistics with sets of phylogenetic trees, right, which was the original motivation, right, you actually run into some pretty bad um, statistical issues, right? So two of them here are known as uh, stickiness and high dimensionality. So stickiness is something kind of, um, kind of special. So here's an example of stickiness. So this, uh, this sort of skeletal structure here, so this three spider here is exactly the space of a beach free space of the trees of trees with three leaves, right? So you can see here that this is the representation of it. So remember, if you have um, three leaves, right, then you have one internal edge, right? So basically, you can correspond. Um, basically, you can assign a ray, right, uh, a, a array to each internal edge here, and this will give you exactly three. Um, um, the, this this three spider will give you exactly the the space of beach free space of, of trees with three leaves. So um, if you want to compute the fresh mean of trees living in the space, right, um, look at this example, right? So assume that these three red points here are our data points, right? And we want to compute the position of X, right, which is the Berry Center or the fresh mean, right? So we solve this optimization problem, right? We want to minimize, um, minimize this um, by definition to give you the fresh mean, right? And it turns out that the solution of this is x is equal to zero when a is less than two, and x is equal to a minus two over three when a is greater than two, right? So what this means here is that you can perturb your data points and your mean won't change, right? So this basically means that your mean is sticky, right? And this is this is a serious problem if you want to do statistics because basically it means that in some cases you can actually get new samples and you want to try and compute the mean and it's not going to change. Right. And so this means that you can't do things like hypothesis testing. You can't get um, like large sample approximations. Right. And um, you, you basically have a, a mean that, that fails to be injective. Right. Um, so this is one problem. Um, and another problem is that it turns out, um, which I'll discuss a bit later, but um, Baron Sturmf has also proved this um, and, and collaborators also proved that this um, result that um, basically BHV polytopes, so basically what these are sort of like um, subspaces where you can compute the, the edges between the subspaces by the BHV metric um, are unbounded in dimension, which basically means that there's no obvious subspace in order to project your data, right? So it means that it's hard to visualize and it's also hard to do dimension reduction. So this means that things like PCA um, in BHV space are extremely challenging. Um, so, so yeah, so basically this is why, you know, we, we want to look at, you know, an alternative representation to see if there's any other way that we can do statistics, right? So, so that was sort of um, 
the, the whole motivation and that's that's sort of what what we did right so what what me and my my collaborators have done so if you want to do this right so we want to take this tropical grassmannian which we've seen to coincide with true space right but we want to look at a different metric and see if there's another metric that gives us sort of nicer um, properties um, to avoid this bypass this problem of stickiness and high dimensionality so we define um this tropical metric. So we look at this tropical metric um, on, on, which is defined for trees, but is actually defined on the tropical projective torus. And it's given by this expression here, right? So it's the min of all, I mean, it's the max of all um, pairwise distances between the elements in your vector representation of your tree minus the min. Right, so maybe um, it's it's you can you imagine it's quite combinatorial in nature, but um, maybe I'll just give an example here, which um, which probably gives you more intuition on how this metric works. So this tree here, right, is represented by this vector, and this tree here is represented by this vector, right? Um, and so the, these, I mean, these these uh, this graph here is actually to scale. Um, for these two trees um, here. So this is this is sort of like an accurate representation of what these trees look like is here. So what we do now is we take all of the distances, uh, all the differences between each of the coordinates in these vectors, right? So basically elements in the vector. So we have 10 minus 10, um, 10 minus 10, 10 minus 10, and then eight minus six, eight minus six, and four minus one, right? So then we take the max of these differences, which is four minus one, which is three, and subtract off the min, which is zero, 10 minus 10. And so the distance, the tropical distance between these two trees is three, right? So this is this is how this metric works. And it's one, one thing that we've actually proven is that this is actually a rigorous metric. So all of the properties of this metric holds, including triangle, tri um, triangle inequality. So it's not like a pseudo metric or anything like that. It's actually a real honest to goodness metric. And so um, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So if, if one vector was like, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and the other vector was 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, you know, I'd think this distance was zero, but but now that's making me think that those are not possible vectors. Is that correct? Well, they're not going to be trees, right? Because you have to have okay. them satisfy the the um, the four-point condition, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, okay, so we have this, this metric, right? And it turns out with this metric here, we can actually... Um, do another sort of like um, trick, right? So we can play around with the spaces and stuff also um, given this metric here, right? So we have an isometry um, between the tropical projected torus with Rn minus one, right? So you can actually identify this space, right? So the tropical projected torus equipped with the tropical metric with a normed linear space in the following manner, right? So we get a linear isomorphism and then you can actually define a, a norm and then you get an induced distance also where you actually get um, an isometry, right? So, so basically the point of this here, right, is to say that, okay, you have this nice equivalence with Euclidean space n minus one, which you can actually play around with and, 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 and prove nice results, which is what we've used a lot. We use this sort of trick to, to, to prove um, a lot of our results in our space. But in particular, also what this shows is that this is a very different space from B3 space because we know that a normed linear space, right, is a cat K space, right? If and only if the norm induced by, um, the norm is induced by an inner product, right? So here, since we have N minus one with this, um, this induced distance, it's not a Hilbert space. It means that it's not a cat K space, right? So it is a very different space from BHV space, even though um, we have this sort of like nice like identification from the tropical geometry um, result before. So, so here we see here that we do not have a cat K space, right? So, um, okay. So now we have these two representations of tree space and we have these two different metrics, right? One is very popular, the BHV space and everybody uses it and understands it here. Um, how can we sort of convince people um, like give them sort of an intuitive understanding of how our distance works. Well, um, one is to prove a stability theorem, right? So here what we have is we prove that we have um, boundedness, right? So our metric, like distances between trees given our metric is always bounded by the BHV distance, right? So, um, right, so we don't have an isometry, right? But we have, we have like that our, our, our metric is well behaved with respect to BHV space. So it means that sort of intuitive, geometric slash sort of pattern ideas like for example clustering are going to be preserved right 
So here um, we also have, or we also proved here that um, it's, so this constant here, the stability constant, right? Um, square root of n plus one, this is the smallest possible stability constant. Um, and one thing that I would also like to note here is that um, this BHV metric here that we computed is not actually the BHV metric, which originally um, Villarreal Homes and Boatman proposed, because we actually, in our case, we, our trees actually have to um, include the external edges. Whereas in the original construction of beach free space, remember that external edges were not included, right? So, I mean, this looks sort of worse than it really is because we're also adding in the external edges here. Um, but um, yeah, so basically we have this sort of relationship between our metric and their metric. Um, but again, using this sort of like isometry and these different mappings and these different sort of like quotient spaces and things, um, we actually can get pretty nice results, right? So one of the things that we show, right, is that um, the tropical tree space, right, also has a nice topology, right? So it actually has the same topology um, as in Euclidean space, right? So we have the open Euclidean balls and then the open tropical balls define the same, the same topology. So this here, this here is an illustration. Um, if you're looking at um, beach tree space with three leaves, right? This is what the open ball looks like um, with respect to the tropical metric. So you can see that the topology is really Euclidean. But here, this is the same ball in beach tree space. So you get this weird kind of, you know, skeletal ball here, right? So we don't have the same topology in this case here. So this is sort of like at least from the sort of like, you know maybe sort of comforting kind of like, okay, what's like nice that we know. So even if it's not something that's a linear space, right? We know that the topology is quite familiar um, in Euclidean space. And it turns out that um, if you want to do sort of like uh, probabilistic kind of questions, right? Like where you're looking at probability measures and things like that, right? This, this topology result um, is pretty important because it means that what we get with, with the tree space under the tropical metric is that we can actually get that it's a um, polar space, right? So it basically means that it's separable, completely metrovisible tropological space. It means that probability measures, distributions, expectations, and variances and everything like that exists. So it means that um, if you wanna do statistics in this space with respect to the tropical metric, whatever statistical or probabilistic question that you wanna ask is going to be well-defined, right? And it's going to have a solution that's well-defined as well. Um, okay. So geometric properties. So this is um, earlier work by Baron Sturfels and my co-author um, Bolin. Um, so a comparison of these of these sort of geometric properties here. So it turns out that um, in our space, geodesics are not unique, um, whereas they are in beach free space because it's a cat zero space, right? Um, so this is sort of a bit of a, a, a um, a complication here, right? Um, but it turns out that the complexity of geodesics, computing them is um, lower than in beach v space. Um, the dimension of polytopes, right? So dimension of subspaces, right? Is at most two. And then the depth of a random geodesic path. So the depth here is basically the largest co-dimension of all cones um, traversed um, between two points here, right? So it's actually something low. So here, I'm not gonna put focus too much detail on, on this idea of depth here, but low depth is good because basically um, um, large depth leads to the sticky means, right? So here, these last two properties, right? The fact that we have um, a, a dimension of at least of at most two and low depth, it means that uh, it's very sort of promising in towards the idea of bypassing the problem of stickiness and, um, and no um, lower dimensional subspaces, right? Um, Okay, so yeah, so so that was sort of like an overview. Um, what else do we know? I mean, sort of wrapping up now because it's getting towards the end. Um, and so what else do we know? Um, so in BH3 space, right, um, remember we had this very nice construction where each orthant, right, you assign an orthant to each tree topology, right? So it's a very nice sort of intuitive organization of, of, of tree space, right? So this is less intuitive in the tropical version of this. So the question here is like, how are tree topologies organized in our, in our, our setting, palm tree space, right? So it's tropical tree space right here. Um, so that was a question that we answered in a, in a recent paper, right? Which is um, now preprint on the archive, right? So um, the, it turns out that we don't have this nice sort of like, um, assignment of one orthant to each tree topology. But what we actually did um, manage to show, right, was that if you give me two trees, um, 
then I can give you the tropical line segment between them, right? And I can also tell you exactly what the tree topologies are that occur along this tropical line segment, right? So it's basically giving you a way to compute all of the tree topologies that occur along this tropical line segment. So it's not exactly as, you know, as nice as saying, okay, you have this nice sort of organized structure, right? But there is a computational way and it's a combinatorial theorem that we proved, right? Which gives you a way to identify all of the tree topologies which are associated um, with the shortest with the shortest path between um, two two uh, trees in in our in our setting, um, and how do you actually use this to sort of construct a framework for inference? Like if you wanted to do hypothesis testing, so this is a, another another paper that um, we wrote here where we studied the the optimal transport problem, right? Where we actually defined Wasserstein distances. So um, just a reminder that Wasserstein distances it's actually um, a distance between probability measures, right? So basically, since we've proven that our setting is a well-defined rigorous probability space, um, that means we can collect all the probability measures associated with the space as a separate space, and then actually compute distances on this space here. Um, and it turns out that Wasserstein distances, um, which are also like um, I mean, they're very nice in terms of geometry because the geometry between the Wasserstein space with its original ground space are compatible. Um, but also, it also gives you a very nice framework to do hypothesis testing, right? So in, in this case here, if you want to sort of like have one set of trees, which arises from one distribution, right? And then another set of trees, which arises from another distribution, you want to say, okay, are these the same distribution, right? One way you can do that is basically just computing the distances between these two um, distributions here. And that's what Wasserstein distances give you, right? So here it's also a, a, a framework for, for computing um, for, for inference here. So that's like, at least in terms of the statistical question. So it turns out that also you have like um, other nice sort of um, implications with this work here, given that you know the first paper we have is very combinatorial in nature. So um, you actually get sort of nice combinatorial results, other things that you can answer about this tropical tree space in that perspective um, from the combinatorics. Here in terms of the optimal transport and the Wasserstein distances, it turns out that there's also actually like a more kind of dif differential geometric um, setting and you can answer other questions um, in relation to that as well, which we also studied in the other paper. Um, okay, so just to wrap up now, so palm tree space is the space of phylogenetic trees with n leaves and it's endowed with a tropical metric. So this gives you a sort of nice tropical version of linear algebra if you like. Um, and it turns out that you get nice topological, geometric and combinatorial pro um, properties, which tell you that statistical and probabilistic analysis is valid and well-defined in the space here. Um, and so what else can we do with this? Um, so there's lots of things that I'm very interested in and very excited by um, that I'm working on as well. So one is actually um, explicitly computing these tropical fresh amines and studying them like in terms of like quantifying the stickiness and comparing it to the beach tree space. So this is something that I'm currently working on um, with my collaborators, Carlos Amendola, Stefan Hokeman, Bolin and um, Rudy Yoshida. Um, you can also apply these to other tree-like structures, right? So neuronal morphologies would be another, another setting where we could um, use this. Um, and also other settings where they're using um, trees, right? So um, for example, economics and game theory. So decision trees and sequential games, right? In terms of probability trees, this is something where we can use this. So this could be like a whole other domain of application of this kind of stuff that I think would be interesting. Um, and then also, um, given that, okay, the main theorem of the BHV paper is that it's a cat zero space, which is an implication of its curvature, right? Like we can also study other sort of char um, characteristics of geometry of our space, right? Which are still unknown. So for example, the curvature. So this is one paper that I'm currently writing with uh, Carlos Amendola, which actually characterizes the curvature of the space. Um, okay, so just thank you. This is, of course, like a huge piece of work with uh, using a lot of different elements and nothing that I could ever have done by myself, right? So I have fantastic co-authors to thank for this. Um, Chi Wen Kang from the University of Kentucky, Wan Jun Li, who's at UCLA, Wu Chen Li, who's at University of South Carolina, Bo Lin um, at Georgia Tech, and Rudy Yoshida at the Naval Postgraduate School, but also other amazing people who are like really super smart, super friendly, and very happy to talk that have offered a lot of insight on this. So uh, Carlos Amendola, um, Yuichi Kao, um, Elliot Paquette, and Bern Sternfels. Um, some papers, so these are like the papers that I've written um, on this stuff, and then sort of background literature. Um, and thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions if you have any. 
Thank you. So maybe I would ask everyone to unmute themselves first so that we can thank Anthea and clap. Okay, and now it's time for questions. I have a quick question if that's okay. No, it's not okay. Uh, uh, well, I'll ask it anyway. Um, so it seems that both the BHV approach and the approach of the tropical Grossmannian trying to work within just the space of trees, mm -hmm. but there's also an ambient space of just metrics and there's a natural projection onto the space of trees by taking the ultra metric. Yeah. And so you can imagine all kinds of iterative or algorithms that take advantage of that, that are maybe, let's say computationally simpler, but may deviate a lot from the truth. Has there been any investigation into that? Um, so no, in terms of like actually like um, deviation from the truth, no, but the point, you make an excellent point about um, the ultra metrics and like ambient space, right? So it turns out that actually like a lot of the results that we've done are not like, I mean, we actually say like, we actually study like little results here and there and say a couple things here and there related to tree space, but it turns out that tree space is actually really, really complicated to work on as a space itself, right? So it turns out that the ambient space is much better to like do sort of computational studies as well as the space of ultrametrics, which is a subspace, subspace of tree space. And the main reason why is because it turns out that tree space is actually non-convex, right? So you can have like distances between trees, right? But like the, a, a really important question is, you know, when do you actually exit tree space and get back into tree space, right? Um, and, and this is a really hard question because it's really, really hard to characterize the boundary of the space. Right, um, that's something that we don't know. We know that it's non-convex, but we don't know exactly like how non-convex is it is, right? Is it means mm. like, is there only one region where you actually exit the tree space or is it something that's very spiky where you go in and out all the time, right? Um, and this is something we just don't know yet, um, which I, I mean, I'm, still, I'm very interested in, in studying that, but, uh, but um, it turns out that uh, the, the sort of suggestions that you, you proposed, right? Working in the ambient space or working in the subset of ultrametrics, this actually gives you very nice um, properties, right? And you can actually have very nice um, like results where you can actually like um, say rigorous things in terms of like, I don't know, PCA and like the, the optimal transport problem. You can say hmm. um, a lot more concrete things about these, about these two sort of um, variants rather than tree space itself. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. But as far as it goes in terms of like, um, you know, how, how accurate this is or how, you know, we, we just don't know. Um, that's that's a great answer. Thank you. I, I have a question, uh, if, if it's okay. Yeah, um, go for it. yeah. so okay. you, you wrote down that uh, formula for the tropical metric, mm -hmm. and it, it, it looks very familiar to me in terms of other things I've seen in tropical geometry. What yeah, is, yeah. Exactly. What is Sorry. the motivation? Like, where, where did that formula come from for you? Um, so that one is actually, it's been proposed by other people, like, um, I can't, uh, Marian Akian. Um, for, for example, she's used it and a couple of other people in tropical geometry. So it turns out that this one, we, we use this one because it's like, um, it's, well, first of all, like we're not aware of many other metrics that actually come up in tropical geometry, right? But um, this one here has actually been proposed by people who actually do sort of apply tropical geometry. Um, and so we, we thought that it was a sort of a natural metric to use in that case. But um, there has been other some people, so um, work by um, Noak Tran, for example, where she studied different um, metrics also that we can use like sort of tropical flavored metrics. Um, and she actually also has a whole study about how um, this metric is the most compatible for statistics, right? And, and computation. But um, yeah, I, I don't actually remember all, like all the details of the other kinds of metrics that she studied either, um, but um, yeah, it turns out this one, this one here is is the one that's sort of most compatible with um, things like I'm um, studying PCA, right? So like um, like in in I didn't I didn't have time to actually show it in in this work here, but one of the applications that we actually did was we actually computed PCA with respect to the B three metric and with respect to the tropical metric, and it turns out that this one is sort of like the most well behaved and it gives you the nicest um, nicest properties, right? Again, in terms of dimensionality and. And, and stickiness, right? Or like, I mean, rather depth of geodesics, which leads to stickiness. Um, so yeah, that's why we chose it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, I will stop the recording here, just in case some people have to run it to, uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern time, but feel free to continue uh, asking questions once I do. But once again, thank you, Antia, for the wonderful talk today. Thank you.